Thanks for joining us for this symposium. I'm Bill Rapisi, President and CEO of the Lymphatic Education Research Network. Lauren's mission is to fight lymphatic diseases through education, research, and advocacy. In order to win a fight, you first have to join it. So we ask, please become a supporting member of LEARN at lymphaticnetwork.org. And we hope you enjoy today's symposium. Thank you, everybody. I would like to welcome you to this LEARN symposium. I'm Sheila Reidner, uh, a research professor and professor emeritus at Vanderbilt University School of Nursing. And I will be presenting uh, a research study for which I was the PI today. Uh, the LEARN Symposium Series had numerous uh, industry partners and sponsors that we would like to acknowledge and thank for their support. LEARN sponsored information is provided for you in consultation with your healthcare professional, and it's not meant to take the place of healthcare or health services you may need. Today, we're going to discuss secondary lymphedema prevention, a randomized clinical trial evaluating early detection and early intervention in breast cancer patients. My own disclosures are my employment at Vanderbilt. Funding for this study was made possible uh, through uh, direct contracts or grants to Vanderbilt University. Uh, select site content is used with permission from Impedimed and Medi. Mention of commercial products does not imply my personal or Vanderbilt's endorsement. And presidents, presentation of study results is for information purposes only and does not imply that all or any patients will have similar outcomes from what we found in the study. What we will discuss today are the results from the randomized trial. And then at the end, I want to spend just a couple of minutes discussing translation of research such as this to the actual lymphedema community. Would like to acknowledge that the supporting manuscript from this uh, presentation is available through open access online at no charge to anyone who would like to access it. And I would like to pre present this presentation today uh, on behalf of and in honor of the co-authors on the paper that is listed on the slide. The work was funded by Impedimed Medi and the National Institutes of Health. And the study took place uh, in Australia and the United States. There were nine individual sites in the US and four sites in Australia that were all under the direction of the research team at Macquarie University. The study could not have happened without the 1,200 patients who agreed to participate, and we wish to thank them all for their long-term three-year commitment to the study. As I move through the study, I remind you that you can please put questions in the question and answer section during the discussion uh, and presentation or at the end. A little bit of background about the study. With continuing improvement in breast cancer survivorship, maximizing long-term patient quality of life is paramount to all of us. Lymphedema remains, unfortunately, the most feared dread and dreaded long-term sequela of breast cancer. Lymphedema leads to multiple symptoms, pain, infection, and costly therapy. Lymphedema frequently impacts a patient's ability to work and care for themselves or their family. It creates a lot of psychological distress in both the patients and in the family systems. Prior studies support that prevention of subclinical lymphedema, which is lymphedema that's not visible to the naked eye, um, combined with an immediate short-term compression therapy can prevent and reduce the amount of breast cancer-related clinical lymphedema. However, there remain gaps in the study that led to, gaps in the science that led to the study. Robust and prospective RTCs with long-term follow-up were absent in the literature. 
and data regarding whether a brief intervention initiated based on extracellular fluid change, which involves lymph change only, or whole arm change, which involves lymph, soft tissue, fat, et cetera, would more impact prevention outcomes. The purpose of this PREVENT study was to fill gaps in the literature and science, and our primary aim was to determine if subclinical detection of extracellular fluid accumulation via bioimpedance spectroscopy and subsequent early intervention reduces the rates of progression to clinical lymphedema requiring complex decongestive therapy relative to rates seen when that same intervention was generated often off of the volume change as determined by tape measurements. I'll talk a little bit now about the study overview and design and the inclusion criteria. This was a randomized clinical trial. We conducted pre-treatment, pre-breast cancer treatment, uh, data collection, post-breast cancer treatment. Patients were reassessed against more strenuous inclusion criteria and to remain in the study had to have had either, at least one of the following, just greater than six nodes or axillary radiation or taxane-based chemotherapy. Once the eligibility was reconfirmed, the LDEX group and volume tape measure groups were assigned by a randomized uh, permuted plan. And the LDEX group was followed at uh, increments as same as the tape measure group, which were 3, 6, 12, 15, 18, 24, 30, and 36 months post breast cancer treatment. The 15 and 21 months visits were at the site investigators or site physician uh, discretions. Should the LDEX group have a change from a baseline reading of their LDEX greater than or equal to 6.5, or should the volume tape measure group have a change of five to 10% from baseline? Patients were then assigned to get a 28 day compression sleeve and gauntlet intervention. And they were instructed to wear these uh, gauntlets and sleeves 12 hours a day. If at any time a 10% change from baseline was noted in the tape measurements, which were all taken for all patients immediately prior to applying the compression intervention, patients were referred to lymphedema therapy because they had progressed uh, and had clinical lymphedema. Post-intervention, patients were followed immediately uh, after that 28 days and reassessed to determine if uh, the intervention had kept them below a 10% volume change, which was our clinical lymphedema indicator. And if it had, they remained in the study. If not, they came out at the end of the intervention and uh, were no longer seen for follow-up in the study. Patients who did not uh, have uh, any problems with a volume issue post-intervention remained in the study and were followed for up to three years. And again, this is the inclusion and exclusion criteria. And as you can see, we really tried post-surgically to hone this in for patients who had the most uh, high risk of getting lymphedema. The electronic research record, REDCAP electronic data capture, served as our database and electronic research record for the entire study. Consents, regulatory documents and binders, measurements and patient reported outcome data was all entered and stored in this database. This is a web-based system and patient reported outcomes were um, entered directly by patients via the web into the data capture system. 
The measurement that was used for the bioimpedance was uh, the Eldex measure and uh, an Impedimed product. Each clinical site was trained before the study and annually thereafter by me uh, on the appropriate protocol for using the LDEX in the clinics. And for those of you who may not know, the spectroscopy technology as a whole involves running a small non-perceivable electric current through the body. It measures impedance at different frequencies and detects changes in fluid as small as 2.4 tablespoons. It's been validated against lymphocentigraphy and the LDEX score change of 6.5 that was used in this study uh, has an 80% sensitivity and 90% specificity in detecting subclinical lymphedema. The tape measure, we uh, did the same training before the study and annually thereafter to ensure patients on understood um, what they were going through, going to experience. So we educated the patients on their first visit and we trained the staff prior to seeing the patients. Optical technique was used to ensure the most consistent results could be obtained to minimize the risk of uh, undetected lymphedema progression. The tape measure protocol involved taking measurements every 10 centimeters. The measuring board was used to ensure repeatability a Gulick II tape measure with uh, tension springs was used for every measurement. Each arm was always measured twice and averaged, and volume was auto-calculated using a truncated cone formula. Other measures were conducted during patient visits, and those are being reported in secondary AIM manuscripts, one of which uh, been accepted for publication. Another is under review and they are not going to be presented today. Each of those would render uh, the need for another probably 45 minutes of time. The intervention that we used for subclinical lymphedema involved use the application of a, a Medi Harmony compression sleeve and gauntlet. Again, four weeks, 28 days, 12 hours per day. It's important to note that if needed, custom garments were provided to the patients. Um, and we made sure that all uh, research staff were trained by um, many employees for appropriate measurement and fit of the garment as the research team members applied these garments directly upon identification of the need for the intervention. Well, what did we find? Well, let's start first with how many people were involved in the study. We uh, evaluated over 1,200 people for this study and we enrolled patients between June of 2014 and September of 2018. 1,200 uh, were enrolled at the pre-surgical stage and those baseline data points as I discussed were obtained. And then of those 1,200, 963 met that second screening that we did post breast cancer treatment. Of those 963, 481 were randomized to tape and 482 were randomized to the BIS group. Of those two groups, 20 in the tape measure group and 19 in the BIS group progressed to clinical lymphedema between visits and are not concluded in, included in the analysis for the final uh, study findings and 45 patients had either no valid post-baseline assessments or um, missing data on the key outcome variable. In the final uh, evaluation sample, there were 437 type patients and 442 LDEX patients. Of those 879 patients, the average age was 58, which is about the age of most breast cancer diagnosis around the planet. They were, most were college educated as a medium 
Um, and it was primarily Caucasian, but did have a, a representation of Asian, Black or African America and multiracial individuals. We had um, all participants were female gender, although males were available or as options for enrollment. Uh, if uh, they chose to uh, want to do this. And I've, over 20% of these patients were rural. So this study does capture a, a typically underserved uh, demographic group. Breast cancer stage of diagnosis, as you can see here, was uh, primarily uh, stage ones and twos. And there was a slight difference in the baseline characteristics uh, between the LDEX and BIS groups. However, in those patients who actually triggered the intervention, no difference in cancer stage at presentation were noted in those groups and the p-value for the ones in the 200 that we were actually evaluating for progression uh, was 0.475. The treatment characteristics were um, similar across both groups at baseline enrollment. There was a slight difference in uh, the sentinel node distribution with more LDEX group assigned patients having sentinel nodes versus ANLD, ALND. However, as with the staging in those patients who actually triggered an intervention, there were no significant or meaningful difference between the rates of ALND in those two groups. And the P for that particular variable in the actual groups that, uh, that received the intervention was 0 0.127. So the results of the study, we uh, had 400 and 37 tape measurement patients, and of those, 120 triggered the intervention, or about 28%. And the time to triggering that compression intervention was right at four months medium for those patients. In the LDEX group of 442, 89 patients, or 20%, triggered the uh, prevention intervention. And the median time for that, as you will see, was or almost 10 months. So the LDEX patients actually triggered interventions later in that first year than did the tape measurements. The samples for progression um, to P CDP, uh, again, were 120 for tape and 89 for the LDEX. Now I will acknowledge that that was not uh, what research which necessarily have supported. It would look like um, those groups should have been a little more even, but again, the LDEX uh, group triggered uh, fewer uh, interventions. In terms of progression to that clinical CDP, again, people who had a greater than 10% um, or 10% change in their arm volume from baseline after the intervention was 23 in the tape measure group or 19% and seven in the LDEX group or basically 8%. And that was a statistically significant difference for the uh, clinical outcome of interest in favor of the group that had the intervention generated from change in extracellular fluid. The median time from progression to trigger, uh, meaning from trigger to progression, sorry, was 10 months in the tight group and five months in the LDEX group, and meaning that it took about 11 months after the intervention was finished for the tight measure group to progress, and it took about five for those in the LDEX group to progress. We did an additional statistical analysis to address the possibility that some factors other than just the triggering approach, the tape uh, by volume, 
uh, and the BIS by extracellular uh, was involved in the outcomes we were seeing. And what we found was some risk factors increased the likelihood of progression overall to get clinical uh, lymphedema needing CDP and it's some of the normal culprits, cancer stage, axillary node dissection, chemotherapy, and a combination of, of high risk treatments. Um, we then adjusted for those factors um, it, and found that when adjusting for those, that um, the BIS as the detection method remained essentially equivalent for all adjustments. And this confirmed that one, the groups were balanced and two, that the outcomes we found particularly in the BIS group, were indeed related to the detection of L of the extracellular fluid via BIS for um, these patients. So we uh, have tried very hard to be very vigorous in um, the statistical approach to the study. So what do these uh, results mean for patients? What do these results mean for clinicians? Well, first, I think overall, the study as a whole supports that prospective surveillance with pre-treatment measurements and brief compression interventions should be considered standard of care for newly diagnosed breast cancer patients, regardless of, uh, the, of the treatment setting in which they find themselves. And this is not what is happening right now in this community, as we all know. Watchful waiting is not ideal. Uh, as, as you know, we had some people uh, develop this very quickly. Uh, those 39 that progressed between our early visits in that first year. And this tells us that um, the first year may require more frequent monitoring than what was done in the study. And then just a side note, we chose those measurement points for the first year based on the traditional cancer follow-up treatments for patients. Uh, so those represent the times when patients would normally be showing up for their cancer uh, reassessments, et cetera. And that schedule may not be frequent enough to catch lymphedema early on. The detection of change in extracellular fluid appears to be key to the prevention because there were significant differences between the two groups uh, in favor of the BIS screening for the extracellular fluid. We believe that uh, BIS as a technology um, has demonstrated repeatedly and again in this study that it is more specific for lymphedema detection than tape measure. And I think in this study with very well controlled um, protocols for measurement using BIS and tape, the BIS actually had fewer triggers and longer times to intervention, which supports it's more specific. BIS as compared to tape measure uh, does appear based on our study to provide a more precise identification of patients at a stage most likely to benefit from early compression therapy intervention as a preventive method for this uh, disease that they fear so greatly. So we now have a study that we have completed with a large number of patients that's international with very positive findings that suggest that it is possible to reduce the burden of lymphedema in breast cancer survivors by instituting an intervention that is driven off assertion of changes in extracellular fluid. Typically, translation of research into clinical practice takes a long time. And I'd like to take just a minute to talk about what the implications are and considerations for next logical steps, in my opinion, based on the strong findings in this study. First, researchers should consider extending this work and two areas that our team has discussed that perhaps would be beneficial is to 
to extend some preliminary work done by myself and Dr. Louise Kohlmeyer, who was the Australian site PI for this study in home self-monitoring to see if we can empower patients to monitor themselves at home um, and perhaps catch lymphedema even earlier than you can catch it in a clinic setting. We also think the prospective surveillance early intervention model, which is the term I would like to see us move to because the surveillance is only valuable if we're going to intervene, perhaps should next be looked at in lower limb patients. Lower limb lymphedema as a secondary disease is equally dreadful to arm lymphedema in this patient population. And it would seem that theoretically, this might be a next step clinical group to move to. In terms of clinicians, we would like to challenge clinicians that see these patients in the cancer world and in, in, in areas outside the cancer world, such as rehab centers and OBGYN offices to consider helping translate this evidence into practice now because the data is here uh, to arm them to make some changes. Some of the ways they can help is to lobby for PSEI programs in their clinics and within their peer groups at national meetings and to support practice guideline changes in leading organizations that already may promote monitoring of a patient's post um, breast cancer diagnosis, but nudging them towards offering extracellular fluid as monitoring as a standard of care. Patients and advocacy groups also have a role now in translating research to science, research in science into the community that suffers from these diseases as a whole, the lymphatic community. And with social media now, patients and advocacy groups such as LEARN can help get the word out to many different constituencies. You can start by demanding monitoring as part of your treatment plan if you're a patient who has breast cancer. And advocacy groups such as LEARN uh, can become vocal even more so than they already are about methodologies that might best help prevent lymphedema that are now available and tested with evidence base to support them um, and offer new breast cancer patients options for prevention that older breast cancer patients were not uh, afforded. You can type this open access manuscript to educate and inform others such as surgeons, medical oncologists, rehab professionals, politicians, insurance companies, and funding agencies such as the NIH about what hope might be out there to help prevent this disease uh, in breast cancer patients. And again, can this work be translated to other patient populations? And spread the group within the breast cancer survivorship community. The power exists when patients in advocacy groups such as LEARN work together for change. And I would encourage all of you, if you are not involved in some type of advocacy group for these patients to become involved. The time is now to be very active and help change people's lives. So some other considerations and food for thought, and these come from comments from our patients during the study and from extensive discussions by the multiple doctors who and research team members who helped run all of these patients through the study. First, the patients could not uh, have been more dedicated to this. This study was done by 1,200 patients who wanted to change the lives of people who came after them, even if it didn't help them. I've said over and over to our research team, it's our ethical responsibility at the end of the study to help make these patients dream come true. And presentations such as this and activation by people who are listening to this presentation can help us fulfill that obligation. Just some things to think about before we move into the discussion phase of this presentation. Patients ask us, 
Are cultural changes basically necessary in how medical uh, care is given to in cancer settings in terms of lymphedema monitoring? Who should monitor us? We had in this study, some patients being seen in surgical clinics, others in their med op clinics. And patients had different ideas about which of those settings might work better. And they would tell us that. Who should actually do the monitoring? Nurses or nursing assistants can easily collect this data. They collect blood pressure and weight. And in this study, our research assistants did all the data collection for both of these measurements. They did the garment fitting and we administered the garments as part of the medical treatment team in the clinics. There were no referrals for OT or PT for any of these patients as part of the prevention intervention protocol. Which patients should be followed? And this is a very interesting area. Should this be high risk patients only? Patients who have been identified by their clinicians at high risk, or should everyone get the benefit of this? If you do high risk patients, this will require some agreement on who these are uh, and Treatment modalities are commonly used to determine high risk, but uh, we know from clinical practice that other factors are also important. Should patients only be seen in clinics for these kinds of measurements? What about self-monitoring at home? What about telehealth or even home visits? Patients, as they remained in the study, sought to become more advocates uh, and less patients in terms of their roles in life. And it was wonderful to see many patients start to become more active in the breast survivorship community. And I think anything we can do to support patients becoming advocates is very critical. Again, translation for research into practice historically is lit very slow. And I would stop before the question sessions and say, does it have to be a whole generation of change in medical del healthcare delivery systems uh, for this change, moving towards extracellular fluid monitoring as part of the prevention model with early intervention, or do we let this move on at the pace many other changes have taken to translate, which can take decades? And I would hope we can shorten this and do what we need to do to help these patients as best we can. And with that, I'd like to remind you to please put your questions in the Q&A box in the Zoom. And I will be happy to address uh, any questions that we have. And uh, again, wanna thank you for your attendance today in the middle of an afternoon on a work day for many of you. And one of the first questions that I have is that will your slides be available for download? You're welcome to email me at Sheila, S-H-E-I-L-A dot Reidner, R-I-D-N-E-R -E at Vanderbilt.edu and I will be happy to get you some slides. Lisa asked a really good question, which I had a conversation about with some clinicians yesterday. What about truncal lymphedema from breast cancer treatment? It seems that there needs to be more education on this. This is absolutely true. And truncal lymphedema is um, not discussed in general as much as the arm. However, we're all aware that truncal lymphedema can be very problematic for patients and it can be very uncomfortable, particularly if it is the lemon that I've heard patients describe in their axillary areas. And uh, there are some patient self-report symptom forms that are designed now for truncal lymphedema. Uh, and I'd be happy to hook anyone up with how to get those because one of the ways to start uh, getting it treated is to make sure that we're asking about it. And uh, then we can start working with, with clinicians uh, across um, PTOT, lymphedema treatment, um, 
providers to try to get more active treatment for this. Jean wants to know what is one specific action that patient advocates could take now? Any pressing deadlines for legislation? Um, I would say one specific action that patient advocates can take uh, would be to share the data and with all of the medical health professionals that they come in contact with. Any pressing deadlines for legislation? That's a really good question. Uh, from state perspective, those deadlines vary from state to state. Um, and LEARN has a lot of active chapters and they can perhaps be a good resource for you to contact LEARN and ask them about any legislative opportunities that they are aware of in your state. Okay, I'm confused about what I saw. Take measure to pick sooner than this. Also, that I measure for longer time. Okay, so uh, Marie would like to discuss uh, saying that the tape measure group picked up the changes sooner than this, and that the tape measure group had longer time before need for further therapy. And it seems that the use of early uh, sleeves earlier helped. Uh, what I would like to say to that is that in the tape measure group, we have uh, taken a look at that data. And it appears that in that group, some of those early uh, identifications may have been some false positives uh, in the measurement. However, with that said, uh, the, we are concerned that some of what we picked up in those early three to four months were not necessarily pure lymphatic changes and may have been um, continuing uh, post-surgery, post-radiation inflammation. And I would encourage uh, if there are physiologists in the room to perhaps think about some bench work that could be done to um, evaluate that. The tape group had longer time before need for further intervention. A yes, and uh, I can, uh, can explain that only by saying that um, if we had false positives to start with, the, they may have developed true lymphedema after that first measurement that triggered. Uh, and moving into three months for the BIS, uh, in the very few patients that progressed, and again, we're talking about seven people progressing, uh, we really didn't see any statistical issues between those two groups that were distressing. Uh, and again, uh, both of these groups uh, overall, and I will point out there was a low incidence of, of uh, clinical lymphedema in all the patients that we followed in this study. So there are, uh, as always, Maureen, a lot of questions to answer, uh, but um, uh, this is why we do the work and hopefully some other people will continue to do more research. Are there any, next question is, are there any correlations between self-reported symptoms and BIS findings? We have a paper that was published for the first 24 months of data in the study that looked at the trajectories of symptoms uh, against uh, the BIS findings and against the tight measure findings. And that article is out and has been out for a couple of years. And yes, the self-reported symptoms actually correlate better with BIS than type. We have uh, one of the papers that um, is, uh, under review for um, the secondary aims of the study, further looks at self-reported symptoms and outcomes other than volume change from this intervention. And I would just say, stay tuned. There will be more information uh, regarding the question you ask about symptom correlation and measurements in that paper. Thank you for asking. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions right now. Uh, it'll, hold on, there might be one more. Okay, uh, well, 
I want to thank all of you then for participating in this. I tried to keep this short and sweet out of respect for everyone's time and busy schedule. Please feel free to contact me at my Vanderbilt email for any questions or any information that you might need from, from me. And I would just encourage everybody uh, to please uh, get out and become involved uh, more in the advocacy work for these patients. And I see another question that just stuck in here. It says, what procedures are involved with self-monitoring? That will vary depending on uh, what type of uh, self-monitoring um, instrument that you use. If you use BIS, the procedure is very simple. Uh, there is now a, um, a device called the SOZO that um, allows you very simply just to take it out of the box, set a foot uh, plate on the floor, set a hand plate up on a desk, put your feet with nothing on them on the um, foot plate, put your hands on the hand plate, push a button and it will measure you an improvement in this technology that has happened uh, since this study that I presented actually started. Uh, I've been working with this technology uh, independent of any one manufacturer for over 20 years. And um, the technology has now evolved to where it's literally as simple as the equivalent of stepping on a scale and weighing yourself. There used to be electrodes and leads and all of that has gone away. Uh, and I would refer you to Dr. Kohlmeier's uh, work out of Australia on some of the uh, techniques that she has used most recently for self-monitoring at home. Um, is the SOZO available for home use? That's something I would have to direct you to the manufacturer to address. I try to, I, as a scientist, do not get involved in um, distribution of technology. Uh, I, um, I honestly don't know uh, where they are with a home application model yet, but uh, part of what drives industry to change is patients and therapists calling and demanding change. And that's how part of how the SOZO um, um, got brought to market. It was with patients requesting change and for uh, easier use. And I would encourage you to get in touch with, with the manufacturer of that particular device. Um, and there's a question about what is the minimum sensibility of the bio impedance that we should accept? And I'm not sure that I understand exactly what you're asking. I will tell you that um, just in general, bio impedance as a whole has a technology that has been used now for almost six decades outside of the lymphedema and lymphatic community. It was used for years and um, it has huge bodies of evidence behind it to justify that it does measure what it says it measures and that extracellular fluid is captured by it. And at this point, the technology uh, is, uh, in my opinion, um, where it needs to be to be used routinely in this patient population. Okay, I froze a bit when describing SOZO. Can you repeat how long it takes? Sure. Uh, it takes less than 30 seconds to do this. Um, a full disclosure, uh, my research team was involved in the human factors development of this device. Uh, and um, through a contract that, that was given to Vanderbilt University. And uh, we brought people in who were kids eight years old and weighed 45 to 50 pounds and 300 pound adults um, and worked on design of this. And um, they have gotten this to the point. It's very, very easy to, uh, to use and less than 30 seconds. It comes, if you want, with a stand, so you can literally set it up on a stand with the foot at the bottom, the handhold sections at the top, 
and it can set literally, and we, and one of our ecologists has done this, they set it right by the scales in the clinic, and they can move patients from uh, the weight over to the uh, sozo measurement, and then they can go right in and see their doc. Um, and Maureen has put in a good patient tracking app for measurements online is called Lymph Track. Thank you for sharing that with the group, Maureen, much appreciated. Okay, um, if there's nothing else, I would just like to say it's been my pleasure to communicate this study and this work on behalf of all of the patients and all of the clinicians and scientists who were involved in this. This was a huge study that took a lot of investment and in time and patience to collect data and not know for years what the outcome was going to be. And again, I just wanna thank everyone that was involved in the study. And I wanna thank LEARN and Lymphatic Research Bio and Biology that published this paper for their continuing and unwavering support over the years for the lymphatic patient community. And best of luck to all of you and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.